All right, here we go with the uh, the second assignment. This is uh, assignment 6B. Uh, so before we begin, let's go ahead and review real quickly about what we learned in the last section. So we are talking about antiderivatives, and we are, in essence, going to learn them to be integrals. So if I want to take an antiderivative of something, this is the symbol that you're probably going to be seeing, uh, if not this section, but coming up very shortly. So I want to take an antiderivative of, let's say, x to the fourth power or something, okay? And so with respect to x, what you first do is you increase the exponent. You increase the exponent, and then you uh, divide by whatever was up front by that number. So this is, in essence, going to be one-fifth. And then if, they, if it's not a definite integral, you would put this plus c. So another example would be x to the uh, negative uh, fourth. And so what this is going to be, yes, uh, what this is going to be is x plus 1 and divide. And that's what it is, plus c. Um, so it's easy peasy. And if there is a number up there, just to take that into consideration and you just multiply or divide whatever you need to. And then the last one that is kind of uh, kind of tricky is uh, what happens when we have sine. Let me put it actually a number in here. Okay, uh, and so sine, when you take a, a derivative, just straight up goes to cosine. However, when we do it in integrals or antiderivatives, it has to go to negative cosine. Uh, so think about what the derivative of a cosine is. It's a negative sine, so that would go right back into a sine. So it just kind of makes sense. Now also, uh, there is the chain rule that is going to happen because of the inside too. So the outside uh, would, would be uh, to the sine, and then we multiply by a two, but I don't want anything to be there, so I have to counteract that with a one half. So what I'm trying to say is that sine goes to negative cosine, and then cosine goes to regular sine. Okay. Um, I don't know if there's any others, but again, if you get confused, just in essence, think of what derivative would create that. That's the answer to one of our derivatives. All right, so I believe there was also, you know, like a secant squared. Well, what the hell just created that? Well, that would come from a tangent. If I were to take a tangent, uh, a derivative of a tangent, that's a secant squared kind of concept. All right, so you have these kind of ideas as well. All right. Okay, let's start this off. All right, I know they say don't rewrite it, but I I need to rewrite it. <laughs> okay, so here we go. Uh, so increase by one, that's four thirds. And so that would in, uh, multiply by three fourths, which undoes everything, so that's just one. So that's exactly what I wanted it to be. And because it was a denominator, it's a negative one third. Uh, so that means uh, increase by one. So that would go to a two positive two thirds. And so that'd be three over two. The threes would cancel. So this is going to be a one half. Okay, increase by one, this would be four thirds. There's nothing, so this is just straight up three fourths. X to the two thirds, there's nothing, so this is just going to be three over two. Plus C. Okay. 
Okay, so this is x to the positive one half, which is there, so it's all good. x to the negative one half, which is there, so it's all good. x to the negative three over two, which is there, so it's all good. All right, here we go. Uh, cosine goes to uh, regular sine. That will multiply by a pi, which is supposed to be there, so we're all good. Uh, cosine goes to a regular sine, so again, this is pi over 2x. Uh, so I would chain rule the pi over 2, which is there, so this is all good. Uh, cosine goes to regular sine, so this is pi over 2x, which would multiply out. It's not there, so this has to be 2 over pi. So when I multiply that out, it eliminates itself. Cosecant is created by a cotangent. Cotangent uh, develops a negative cosecant, so uh, when that happens, I need to counteract it. So now it's a positive cosecant on this derivative. So this is going to be cotangent 7x, uh, so negative, and then 7 is there, so that's supposed to be there. So negative, all right, closer. All right, so again, this is negative cotangent. I'm going to have to multiply by 7, but I want that number to be a 1, so I have to counteract the chain rule that I would be forced to do. Uh, cre uh, cosecant cotangent is created by a cosecant, so the cosecant is cosecant cotangent. Again, it's going to be negative, so I counteract it. Uh, so this is going to be negative uh, cosecant, negative cosecant 4x. All right, so the chain rule is going to bring out a 4, but I need it to be an 8, so I boost it up by multiplying by a 2. So cosecant uh, 4x is going to create a negative 4 coming up, but I need to get rid of that 4. So that's how I do it. All right, so the derivative, uh, so that would mean that the original is the antiderivative or the integral of this. Okay, now they give me some, uh, <clears throat> some values, now that I have the antiderivative, it says y is equal to 1 when x is equal to 0. All right, so uh, what this does is eliminates, eliminates is c, and thus I see c is equal to 1. Thus, this actual equation is going to be y is equal to 1 third x squared plus 1x plus 1. C turned out to be 1. So when they give you these uh, these credentials, uh, the, these additional information, you go ahead and get your antiderivative with a C, but then you, then you plug and chug, and that will ultimately solve for C somehow. That, that, that will solve you for C. And so when they give you these, this information, your answers will no longer have a C in the value. That's the reason that they gave you those things, is to get rid of the C. All right, so another example, take the antiderivative. So this is x to the third, that's cool. Uh, x squared, that's cool. 1x, 
all right, and then the C. Now, again, they gave me this information. This is, in, F, in essence, going to solve for that letter C. So they said Y is equal to zero when X is equal to one. So this is one plus one plus one, so that's three, so I minus three. C is equal to negative three. So what does that say about the equation that you originally had? Well, that says Y is equal to X to the third plus X squared plus X minus three. Okay, second derivative, not a big deal. So the, the say, take the antiderivative of the second derivative takes you to the first derivative. Still have to put on a C though. And so here they say the first derivative is equal to four when X is equal to zero. All right, so zero, zero, C is equal to four. All right, so that tells me that this first derivative is actually equal to two X minus three X squared plus four. Okay, but they want a solution. They want to know what is the actual Y. They don't want to know what the first derivative is. They want Y. So here we go. So y, take the antiderivative of this, is x squared minus x to the third plus 4x plus c. They give the second initial condition of y is equal to 1 when x is equal to 0 again. <clears throat> 0, 0, 0. C is equal to 1, thus this actual equation is Y is equal to X squared minus X to the third plus 4X plus 1. That's the solution. So we're just supposed to find the function. All right, so let's, let's talk about what the second uh, thing says. So the graph in the xy plane passes through the point 0, 1. So that says y is equal to 1 when x is equal to 0. So that gave me some information right there. What else did this sentence say? It has a horizontal tangent. That means the derivative is equal to zero, again, when x is equal to zero. So that gave me some more information. All right, I think that's enough information to get this all the way back down to a straight up y. So we begin with the second derivative. All right, so the first derivative is the antiderivative of this, or aka the integral is a 3x squared plus c. So here we go ahead and use uh, this initial condition right here, that, that statement. So what that statement is saying is uh, the derivative is equal to 0 when x is equal to 0. So this c is equal to 0. So that means the first derivative is equal to 3x squared plus zero, 3x squared plus zero. All right, taking this down to y, so antiderivative time, x to the third, okay, plus c. Okay, now we use that other initial condition. It says y is equal to one when x is equal to zero. So this c is equal to one. So this is going to be y is equal to x to the third plus 1. Mm. 
Okay, how many functions are like uh, are there? Uh, how do you know? Um, Well, with these initial conditions, I, I'm assuming that there's only one, okay? I'm assuming that there's only one, but uh, like through this, like how many functions have they set? I'm, I'm confused by the second question. I truly am. Um, I probably have to talk to somebody a little bit more smarter than myself, um, but um, how many uh, functions are there and how do you know? Um, Again, that that's that's asking for like how many how many functions have a second derivative of six x and that go through the point and still have a horizontal. I'm assuming one, but I'm not and I'm not I'm not positive about that answer. I'm not exactly sure about that second question. Don't worry about it. Okay, revenue, et cetera, et cetera. Um, suppose that the marginal revenue uh, is sold is that uh, dollars per unit. Find the revenue. So revenue is just straight up the R. All right. So I have to get rid. So I have to get rid of the derivative portion of this, and so that will be just R. So if the R the X is equal to three X squared minus six X plus twelve, that means R would be the antiderivative of this. And with respect to x, so I need to take what we're going to learn is I'm going to take an integral with respect to x. That's what I'm, we're going to learn eventually. Um, but so this r uh, is going to be the antiderivative. So three, this is two, so that's squared plus twelve x c. Okay, where x is the units sold. All right. So find the revenue. Okay, and then if there is no revenue, so no revenue, if there's no units sold, again, X is the unit sold. So R is equal to zero when X is equal to zero. Uh, so R is equal to zero when X is equal to zero. Zero, zero, zero plus C. So C is equal to zero. So that means the revenue equation is x to the third minus three x squared plus twelve x. All right. Okay, uh, on the moon, the acceleration of gravity is uh, 1.6 meters per second squared. Okay, uh, so the acceleration is negative 1.6 because it's going downwards. You gotta think of direction. Okay. <clears throat> if a rock is dropped into a, a, a crevasse, how, how fast will it be going at the, uh, if it hits the bottom 30 seconds later? Um, okay, so concept. We learned that um, acceleration, velocity, and uh, position, you take derivatives with respect to time to go that way. So if I want to go this way, if I want to go down, if I want to turn it into a velocity and a position, I have to take an antiderivative, or in other words, an integral to turn it into the other. So if I need to know velocity, I need to uh, take an antiderivative to turn it into velocity. All right, so the velocity is the antiderivative of acceleration and I would just chuck on a T. Okay. Um, I'm assuming that this rock is just straight up dropped. So what does that mean? That means the velocity is zero when time is equal to zero. The person didn't throw the rock down. The person didn't throw the rock up. Just held it, velocity zero, let it go. Uh, so that says when time is equal to zero,
the velocity is equal to zero. So that C is equal to zero. So the velocity formula is negative 1.6 T plus zero. All right, so the question is, how fast is this thing going when it hits the bottom and they tell you that it hits it in 30 seconds? So what is the velocity at 30 seconds? It's going negative 48, and this is meters per second. Do not forget the labels, especially on these word problems. All right, AP graders love their labels. Love their labels. You can get this problem completely correct, and if you forget this, uh, it, you almost may as well not do the problem. It, it's, don't forget your labels. <laughs> Cannot stress this enough. Okay, again, gravity is going downwards, so it's going to be negative. Um, okay, with approximately what velocity do you enter the water if you dive from a 10 meter platform? All right, so um, again, velocity is equal to zero when time is equal to zero. So in other words, V of zero is equal to zero. Okay, because it, it's a platform. So you're just on this platform and you dr drop off. All right, so let's start with the acceleration. The ex gravity is an acceleration, and it's negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay, so that implies that the velocity of this thing is negative 9.8 t plus c. Chuck in your initial condition. So I know that at time zero, my velocity is equal to zero. So that says C is equal to zero. So that means this velocity equation is actually 9.8 T plus zero. All right. Um, so I need to know how long it takes for me to hit the water. So um, what I also know is the position is equal to zero. Excuse me, as you were, take that back. We're on a 10 meter platform. So my position is equal to 10 when time is equal to zero, AKA S of zero is equal to 10. My position is equal to 10 when time is equal to zero. How does that fit into this mix? Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, make the position I'm going to take this one step further. The position formula is, uh, this is going to be t squared. So t squared is going to divide this thing. So this is going to be negative 4.9 t squared plus c. <clears throat> uh, put in that initial condition of the position. So when s of 0 at time 0, the position is equal to 10. So that means this C is equal to 10, and my position is equal to negative 4.9 T squared plus 10. All right, we're getting closer and closer. Why did I do all of this? So this is my position. This will tell me time. This will give me a position at any time or vice versa. It will give me any time at any position. So. We're on a platform, okay, at time is equal to zero, we jump off. What is the position when I hit the water? Okay, the position is equal to zero. The position is equal to zero when I hit the water. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get the time it takes to hit the water. What time do I hit that water? 
So I'm going to take my position formula and I want to know what is the time when my position is equal to zero. So minus 10 divided by negative 4.9 uh, and square root, that is square on that. And I will hit the water at 1.4286 uh, seconds. That's when I exactly hit the water. So it takes me 1.4286 seconds to hit that water. The question is, what is the velocity? So the velocity at 1.4286. What is the velocity at 1.4286? So I go ahead, I'll put that in as x, and my velocity is negative 9.8t. And I'm going at uh, negative 14, uh, what is this, meters per second. So that's how fast I am when I hit that water. Notice how it's negative because I'm moving downwards. Velocity has direction. Okay, how long will it take for a tank to drain? If you open a valve uh, to drain water from a cylindrical tank, the water will flow fast when the tank is full, but slow as the tank drains. <clears throat> It turns out that the rate at which uh, the water level drops is proportional to the square root of the water's depth. In the notation of the diagram, this means dy dt is equal to negative k square root y. So y is the depth of the water. Okay, the value of k depends on the acceleration of gravity and the cross-sectional areas of the tank of the drain hole. The equation uh, dy dt um, is is equal to negative k square root y is has a negative sign because y is decreasing with time again kind of like uh, the acceleration idea all right to solve this rewrite that as this and carry out the following steps okay um, so they didn't quite go far enough with this one um, and what you want to do is you want to completely separate this equation right here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply dt to this side. So in essence, what I'm looking at is 1 divided by the square root of y, dy, and then I multiply this dt across. Okay, this is called the separation of variables, where you get all variables of like the letter y on the left, in all variables of the letter T on the right. Okay, and then we take an antiderivative of each side. So the left-hand side would be Y is equal to positive one-half um, times two to counteract that, and plus C, I'll call it C1. And the antiderivative of over here, notice how that is not the letter T, so this is just going to be negative KT plus C2. All right. Now, what we're going to learn is that these Cs really don't make much sense to have both of them, especially if they're uh, all created at once. So what we're going to do is we just generically call one of these C. That's what uh, the next step is asking us to do. Okay, so set them equal and combine their arbitrary constants into one single arbitrary constant. That's what I just described. Uh, and this will be the equation. And so now what I see is we have 2 square root y is equal to uh, negative kt plus this arbitrary c. It's worthwhile that if you are going to be solving for the c, uh, this is the point that you do it. Don't wait till later. This is the point that you do it. However, uh, let's solve for y. So the first thing that we do is we divide by 2. And then we, uh, then we square. I 
I think the book, this is a question from the book, uh, heats the top and heats it as like a generic square. They might like change the order a little bit and then they square the bottom. So it's that, however you want to write it. Uh, but that would be your direct relationship of Y to T. As I said, I think book says it's that, so I'll just say that. I, I don't. Okay, suppose T is measured in minutes, K is one tenth. Uh, find Y as a function of T if Y is equal to nine feet when T is equal to zero. Oh, continuation of 13. Good gravy. I'm like, what the heck are they talking about? Okay, let's. <laughs> like, what are they talking about? Let's copy this. Oh, come on, man. All right, let's take it off. Okay, uh, suppose uh, T is measured in minutes, okay? Uh, K is equal to one tenth, all right? Find Y as a function of T. If Y is equal to nine, uh, when T is equal to zero. Okay, so let's put in those variables. So y is equal to 9. And k is equal to 1 tenth. T is equal to 0. All right, so this is going to be... Uh, <clears throat> This is multiplied by zero, so don't worry about that. Um, so nine times four square root. So that should be C. Plus or minus six. Um, C is equal to plus or minus six. Yeah, just kind of keep that in mind. It's most likely a plus, but you know, so, so I don't know. So what is the, the equation for y? y is equal to uh, negative one tenth Yeah, so k is constant, it'll say that constant, I believe. Um, I think it's one tenth, I'm pretty sure it's one tenth. Um, T uh, plus C, or in this case, plus or minus 6 squared divided by 4. That's the depth. How long does it take uh, the water it, to drain if it's 9 feet uh, to start with? Okay, so T is the time that it takes to drain if it's at nine feet to start with. See if you know. Why is the depth? Oh, so so they, they, they're just repeating the initial condition that they gave right here. So all the numbers that we found are indeed what they are. And so they want to know what is this when the depth is equal to zero. All right, so zero times four square root of zero. So zero is equal to negative one tenth T plus or minus six. So here's where that plus or minus comes into play. What makes the logical sense? Would your answer be, you know, negative 60 or would your answer be positive 60? Well, of course, the time would be a positive 60. So what would create that is uh, this six 
has to be a positive number. All right, so all along, this has to be a positive number, again, to make this operate. Okay, I digress. So this would be minus 6 times negative 10. And so T is equal to 60. And again, they love their labels. What is T? T is measured in minutes. How long does it take to drain? In this situation, it would take 60 minutes to drain. 